you, Zach. Is anything too hard for God? It's a rhetorical question. And the answer to that is no. There is nothing too hard for God. We have arrived at the beginning of the holiday seasons. It's interesting to me, if you look around in all of our modern technology and inventions, man has managed to achieve, it seems, with each new year, a brighter and brighter existence. Lights are now replaced with LED lighting and you go around Walmart and it seems 24-7 lights are shining brightly. Old lights that were once had a time frame on them have been replaced with a limitless and a lifetime guarantee of light bulbs that are guaranteed to shine brighter and longer until the end of your life. But I think all of that is just a masquerade, a mask to try to hide the problem of man's heart, an inner darkness to which the most of humanity have never found a solution. Today I want to talk about that problem and about the solution. You may be entering into Thanksgiving and even approaching the Christmas season. Some of you I'm sure have already got Christmas trees and lights and decorations put up and you are gladly approaching that time. But let's be honest, for many people, they put a smile on the outside, just like the lights are turned on, but on the inside, there's something missing. And I wonder if that's you this morning. If somehow you've found your way into the middle of this building, in the middle of this worship service, and although you can smile when the songs and the hymns are sung, something is desperately wrong inside. I want to talk to you about the solution to that problem this morning. John chapter 8, I want you to find it with me. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 8. If you do not own a Bible, we'd love to give you one. We believe that everybody needs a copy of this book. It's God's Word. It'll guide you. It will give light to you. And if you're here this morning and you do not own a Bible, we would love to help you get one. But if you do have one with you, I invite you to turn to John chapter 8. Now, John is the fourth book of the New Testament. The New Testament begins with the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. If you've gone too far, you'll find yourself in the book of Acts. So John chapter 8, let's read together the first 12 verses. I'll read aloud if you'd like to follow along quietly. John chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, 
but shall have the light of life. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray that God would speak to our hearts this morning. How many of you know you need to hear from God today? Would you raise your hand? Then let's pray that he would speak. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the time we've already had together in this place. But really, we've gathered to worship thee and to hear from thee. And as we open up thy word now, we pray, send thy Holy Spirit to enlighten our understanding, to open our minds and our hearts, to soften the hardness of our hearts. Lord, if our minds are clouded today, if we are already distracted, thinking about lunch plans and different activities, then I pray thy Holy Spirit would work in a supernatural way to remove all of those things which are fighting for thy attention, for our attention this morning. And instead, let us listen to thee without any other words or thoughts distracting us. Speak to us, we pray. We ask of thee, Lord, have mercy on us today. Save souls this morning. Father, our hearts are grieved and burdened at the condition of the world around us, the condition of our own city. And Lord, our hearts are burdened as we think about the families of this church and those who are even visiting today, those who need thee. And we pray, have mercy on them, Lord, and save someone, save many this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We come to this famous statement given by the Lord Jesus. It's a brief statement that summarizes and says an awful lot. I am the light of the world. In one verse, in one sentence, the Lord Jesus reveals the condition of this world, his own character, and our only hope and cure for our problem. When Jesus stood and he declared to all who were listening, I am the light of the world, he was implying and stating very clearly that this world needs light. Would you look here for a moment? I don't care where you've come from, how successful you view yourself to be, you need light. You need light. And I'm not talking about LED lights. I'm talking about the only light that satisfies the darkness inside your soul. I want to take a couple of moments and talk about the condition of our world, which happens to be the condition of your soul, naturally. Jesus says in that one verse, I am the light of the world. Verse number 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Meaning this, look here. That when you do not follow Christ, meaning we're all born without Christ and we're born not following him. So until you begin to follow him, you are in darkness. You're walking in darkness. You're living in darkness. You're thinking in darkness. Your whole life is summarized with darkness. Very clearly. The book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, 700 years before Jesus walked on this planet, the prophet said, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. I don't know if you can tell or not, but the world is not becoming a more pleasant place to live. And it's not just church people who are beginning to see that. America is not the country she once was. The world is not the world that it once was. And naturally speaking, if the world should continue for any amount of time, it will get darker and darker and more evil. You know it, you feel it in your own life. Never have parents had to worry so much about sending their children to school as they do today. They worry about things as, as ridiculous as, is my child going to live today? 
with the reports of shooting and, and killing in schools and the reports of the things that are being taught and the behavior and the words spoken to leadership. Never has there been such a disrespect for authority as there is today. The world is getting darker. We feel it, don't we? The prophet Isaiah said that darkness would cover the earth. It has covered the earth. The prophet said that gross darkness would cover the people. That means dark darkness. Thick darkness would cover the people, and that's where we are today. Jesus called it blindness in another portion of Scripture. We have some folks, some members of our church who are physically blind, but the kind of blindness that Jesus was speaking about was the spiritual blindness. The Apostle Paul wrote in the second letter to the Corinthian church, he said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, speaking of Satan, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Would you look here for a moment? If you're not saved today, that means if you've never been born again, I'm not asking, I'm not talking about those who call themselves Christians. The majority of America calls themselves Christians, but you and I have figured out a long time ago, you can say one thing and not really mean it. And we've discovered a long time ago that not everyone that calls themselves Christian is actually Christian. And so we say this very plainly, that if you are truly saved then you are a Christian. But if you're not, the Bible says that your mind has been blinded. Look here for a moment. You're blind. You may have come into this, this building today uh, for one reason or another, coming to celebrate Thanksgiving, coming to be with your family, coming because somebody invited you. You may have come in for one reason or another, and you may not even recognize that you are actually blind, spiritually blind. You say, I can see just fine. I can see you. But can you see you? Can you see your condition? Can you see the state that you're living in? Can you really see? Jesus says you can't. The darkness that we find in the world is twofold. It's a moral darkness and a spiritual darkness. We're living in a society that wants to do away with morality. The entire Western world wants to erase morality. In fact, we've gone so far, we've gone from a moral society to an immoral society, and now we've entered into an amoral society where we don't even believe in morality anymore. Just speak to people on the streets. There is no right or wrong, they argue. There is no morality what is right for you may not be right for me, people try to argue. What darkness we've come to. Moral darkness. We're born with that. It's a propensity to sin. We are bent on sinning. We are morally broken from the time we enter into this world. And, and just watch a little baby. It doesn't take, doesn't take long, does it? Doesn't take long. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to steal. You don't have to teach a child to say no. He picks that one up pretty quickly. You don't have to teach a child to disobey or be disrespectful. But you have to teach them, don't steal. That doesn't belong to you. You have to teach them, do not be disrespectful. By the way, we live in a society that's forgotten that we need to teach our children these things. You have to teach a child what is right and what is wrong. You have to tell them no. Sorry. Oh, don't tell your child no. Somebody needs to. We are living in a society that has gone so far into darkness. And the worst part is because the majority of society lives there, we are tempted to think that it's normal. 
We sin knowing that it's wrong and then we justify or excuse our behavior with a multitude of reasons that really don't make any sense. God's given every man a conscience that testifies to what is right and what is wrong. And we push against that from the time we're little. We argue with that inner light until we get to the point where the light is so dim that we don't see it or hear it anymore. Is that you today? Moral darkness. Are you living in moral darkness? Have you allowed yourself to enter into a lifestyle of sin and you have excused it and justified it so that it has become normal for you? If so, you're living in darkness. And then there's a spiritual darkness, another kind of darkness spoken of in Scripture. This spiritual darkness is about an ignorance to God, an ignorance to His ways, an ignorance to His character. And by the way, the world and even those who gather into buildings like this on a weekly basis largely are living in spiritual ignorance. And there's nobody to blame but ourselves. Spiritual darkness. Ignorance, no relationship with God, therefore no communication with God, no discernment from God, no vision from God, no understanding of life, and therefore darkness. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Is that you this morning? Does this describe you today? Now let's go back to that statement. I am the light of the world. The world is in darkness and the world needs light. Now look, nothing, nothing ever is dynamic and nothing ever actually makes a difference until it becomes very personal and specific. And it's all good and well for me to stand up here on this platform in my three-piece suit and tell you that the world's in darkness if I don't do anything about the darkness in my own heart. And it's all good and well for you to sit in a padded pew today and say, yes, this world is dark. And yes, it's getting worse. But what about you? What about you? Is there darkness in your life? Let me talk to you for a moment about the character of Jesus. I am the light of the world. The answer to the world's darkness is Jesus Christ. The answer to your moral darkness is the spotless Lamb of God who was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Are you struggling with sin this morning? Look here. Are you struggling with morality, with doing the right thing? Then your only hope is the spotless Lamb of God Amen. who never sinned one time. Look, you don't come to me. I, I can't save your soul. Well, you can come to me and I'll tell you who can. Amen. But you need Christ. You need the spotless Lamb of God. You need Jesus who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens because he's the light of the world. Amen. Oh, but you don't know what I've done. You may be thinking. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the darkness that I've lived in. You're right, I do not know what you've done and I don't really need to know. But there is one who already knows. And still he declares to you this morning, I am the light of the world. I'm the light, Jesus says, that he's the light that your darkened heart needs. I want you to think about the context of the verse. Do you remember what we read a moment ago? This verse, this statement about being the light of the world follows the catching of a woman in the very act of adultery. Don't forget that. A woman living in moral darkness, a woman living in spiritual darkness, ignorant of God's love and ignorant of God's grace. And this is where it becomes deeply personal to each one of us this morning. What good is it if Jesus is the light of the world and yet still today you live in darkness? What good is it? 
What good is it for there to be a cure for your condition and yet you never get it? I am the light of the world. I love that word. I love the emphasis of the gospel. It's a universal solution. I am the light of the world. He didn't say I'm the light for part of the world. He didn't say I'm a, I am the light for just a few people. He said I am the light of the world. The light of life is for everyone. And that means you this morning. Whether you're here or whether you're watching or listening, the Lord Jesus is for you. So then we must ask the question, why are still so many living in darkness? And why are you still living in darkness if Jesus is the light of the world? Because there's a condition, a condition. Look what he says. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Did you catch that? Jesus did not say, look here for a moment. Jesus did not say, I am the light of the world. He that says he follows me shall not walk in darkness. He did not say, I am the light of the world. He that comes to Temple Baptist Church shall not walk in darkness. No, no. Not what he said. No, he said, he that followeth me. Are you tired of living in darkness today? Are you tired of living in more, a constant moral failure? Are you tired of living in ignorance this morning? Then you need to follow Jesus. That's your only hope. He's the cure. The light is here and the only answer for your darkness is Jesus, the light of the world. But the question is, will you follow him? Now, the invitation to follow Jesus is simply an invitation to believe. That's what it is. To follow the light is to believe on Christ. Amen. Look at John chapter 12. Turn your page just a couple of, uh, turn in your Bible a couple of pages to John chapter 12, verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Let me warn you this morning, only a little while, only a little while will he have this chance. It's not a game. Only a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, Amen. that ye may be the children of light. Believe. Look, some of you do not believe. You say you do, but you don't. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Look, verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Amen. Believing on Jesus means you're no longer in darkness. And look, some of you say you believe, but yet you're still in darkness. Amen. There's a problem. There's an inconsistency with your tongue and your heart. There's something wrong with your language and your lifestyle. You proclaim one thing and your life says an entirely different thing. Stop it. John tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. There it is again. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie. Are you listening? Look here for a moment, please. I wonder how many people are lying today. Lying to themselves, lying to the church, lying to God. They say, I am a child of God. I have fellowship with God. I know God. I'm a child of God. I've been born again. And yet you're living in darkness. That's good. You're a liar. Yeah. 
Who do you think you're fooling? And some will come into church houses and, and all they'll do is, is laugh and cut up and pass notes and, and scroll on the internet week after week without a care and a thought about Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll sit at the back and talk about the football game and have no care or concern about lost and dying souls. You're living in darkness. Right. You're living like everybody else. Mm. We're lying. But there's still hope. There's still hope. The invitation to follow Jesus is, is an invitation to believe on him. Think about Israel for a moment. Forty years they wandered. Do you remember? Remember when they were hungry, what did God do? He gave them what? Manna from above. When they were thirsty, what did he do? Do you remember? The, the rock was split and he gave them water out of the rock. And when they were in darkness and didn't know which way to go, God sent a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them, right? Well, in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus said, I am the true bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. And in John chapter 7, he stood in the temple and he said this, I am the rock from which the water flows. If you're thirsty, come to me. And here in John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The same way that Jesus, that God led Israel through the wilderness both day and night. He will lead you if you follow him. Amen. But here's the problem. We're not following him. We're not following him. We're not following Jesus. He's the true light. Some believe, well, the Bible tells us, look there again in, verse, in chapter 8, verse number 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, verse 2, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. Some believe that early in the morning the sun was rising. And Jesus says, I'm like that. I am the light of the world. Others believe he stood in the temple and it was just after the feast had been concluded and there were two candlesticks that were lit throughout the beginning of the feast and they were put out at the end of the feast and some believe that the candles were still smoking from where they'd been put out. And Jesus says, I'm not like that light. I'm the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall never walk in darkness. Amen. Are you walking in darkness? Are you following Christ? I wonder, I want to warn you this morning because there are many false lights in this world. There are many LED lights, fluorescent bulbs, whatever you want to call them. There's a whole lot of them. There's the false light of reason. When that brain gets to working and you can't match up all the things you read in scripture with you just can't really believe it it just doesn't really make sense you're not sure about all those miracles and you're not quite sure it seems a bit far-fetched and that false light of reason be careful because it's not a true light and that light will burn out on judgment day there's the false light of religion well uh, uh, some, we, we say all the time, it's interesting, I went to watch uh, Eliana play basketball yesterday and, and there we were playing at a Catholic school, playing a Muslim school, uh, a Muslim school. A Muslim team at a Catholic school. I thought to myself, this is ironic. And here we are, the Temple Crusaders. <laughs> Thankfully, no blood was shed. It was a good game and everybody behaved and we were able to have a good testimony but I thought ironic and we always point the finger at other religions and say look at those they're living in religion they're in darkness but we do the same we think that because our title is different we're better than other people we think that because we go to an independent Baptist church and throw, throw the, the fundamental on the front of it, because we go to an independent and a fundamental Baptist church, we surely got it right and everybody else is wrong. My friend, if you're just going through the motions, you're no different than any other religion. Amen. You're trusting in a religion rather than Jesus. And it's a false light to think that because you come and you sit in the same place every week that you're going to heaven because of your position. You need Jesus. You need to know Christ and follow Christ and walk with Christ or else you are trusting the false light of religion. And oh, what about that modern light of liberalism? You know, we got to get with the times, don't we? We got to go with the flow. And our society is enlightened now. No, no, that's a false light. It's no light at all. 
and that light is taking millions to hell. Be careful. We have a light, and that light is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 36, verse number 9, For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. What a thought. To follow light, to follow Christ is to believe on Christ. And to follow the light is to commit to Christ. I want you to hear me for a moment, and I'll conclude. To follow the light. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me. To follow Christ is to commit to Christ. I want you to hear me for just a moment. Just as Israel followed that pillar of fire, whenever it moved, they moved. Whenever it stopped, they stopped. Whenever it tarried, they tarried, asking no questions, marching on by faith. So we also must follow Jesus. Amen. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4 says, These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Is that you this morning? Look here. Is that you? Do you follow Christ whithersoever he goeth or do you follow your own whims? Do you follow your own desires? The world says, follow your heart. That's the worst thing you could ever do. That's right. Follow your heart. Whatever your heart, that's the absolute worst thing you could do. Do you know how many marriages have abs absolutely been wrecked and ruined because somebody followed their heart? Do you know how many people fell off the deep end because they followed their heart? Don't follow your heart, please. The Bible says it's desperately wicked. Follow Jesus. Follow Christ and only Christ. It's a commitment. If we believe on him, if we commit our lives to Christ, if we trust him, there's a twofold promise. Look what he says. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, number one, shall not be in darkness. There's deliverance from darkness. Praise God, there's deliverance from darkness. You don't have to live like you've always lived anymore shall not walk in darkness and shall have the light of life. You'll have light for the rest of your life. Let me ask you again, are you walking in light? If you're walking in darkness and you say you have fellowship with him, you're lying to yourself. Now I wonder how many are lying today. The answer to the darkness inside is found in Jesus. And you may be visiting here this morning and think, whew, this is a little bit much on my first day. But I want you to know it's exactly what we need. Yes, it is. It's what we need in a world that is getting progressively darker. We need light. We need truth. And the Lord Jesus says today, I am the light of the world. Will you come to him? Will you commit your life to him this morning and follow him? Will you believe by faith that the spotless lamb of God died for your sins, that darkness inside of you, he died to take it away, to wash it away with his own shed blood? Will you believe that he died for you, was buried and rose again to give you eternal life, to put you into light for the rest of eternity? Will you believe that? If you will believe that, will you follow him? But don't say you believe it if you're not going to follow him. Because all you're doing is lying to yourself and everybody else. How many times have people come forward and, and said, do you believe the Lord Jesus died for you? Yes, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Do you believe he was buried and rose again to purchase your salvation? Yes, mm -hmm, yes, I do. And we never see him again? Why? I'm the light of the world, he that followeth me. Followeth me. Shall not walk in darkness. What about you this morning? Would you bow your heads with me, please?